Begin self-publishing, episode number 55. Moving from non-fiction to fiction with Paul T. Interested in self-publishing but don't know where to start? Want to get your book onto Amazon? Want to hold your paperback book in your hands? Learn how on the Begin Self-Publishing podcast with your host, Tim Lewis. In this week's show, I'm lucky enough to talk to another self-publishing podcast host in Paul Teague. He's recently started his Self-Publishing Journeys podcast, where he interviews up-and-coming self-publishers, more focusing towards people at the beginning of the journey, to see how people's self-publishing journeys start. I've actually been interviewed on his show, on the, released on the same week as this show is released. So if you search out his latest episode you'll probably find an interview with me on his show. I kind of scheduled this recording to be released at the same time. Paul is in the process of moving from having a fairly successful career writing non-fiction into trying to get more into his love, which is writing fiction. I talked to him in this episode about his transition from non-fiction to fiction and the challenges that he has faced in doing that. Now over to the interview. Hi, Paul. You've had some success with non-fiction books. Why did you decide to try and move to fiction? Well, I started a long time ago with non-fiction. Doing this interview made me think quite hard about it, actually. I'd forgotten the non-fiction that I did start with. I'd uh, done a book called Total Marketing Success ages ago with a friend. Uh, I can't even remember, was it 2012, 2013, something like that? Uh, 2013, I've got it in front of me here. And I didn't know what to do then. It was, it was done on CreateSpace, and my friend's auntie proofread it. And it was made up of transcripts of interviews. We, need to come up, we, need to, we were selling a digital product, which was quite high priced, and we needed to come up with one of these branding books very fast. So we produced this. We got transcriptions very quickly of interviews that we'd done with internet marketers. And we turned it into really quite a nice little book. It, it's lovely. It's very good quality. And my mate Phil at the time knew how to do that. Before that, I'd done... I've counted them five PDF books, which is what e-publishing used to be in the bad old days before Kindle came along. We all used to sell e-books. So I got five of those internet marketing books. And the problem with all of them was that they date so quickly. Uh, one, one of those books, the, the one that sold best was a, a ClickBank book. It was telling internet marketers in their industry how to sell as an affiliate and to make money on ClickBank. And it just it kept changing every five minutes. And, and that was the thing that triggered the change, I think, that, I mean, it was true to say that with internet marketing as well, the problem with internet marketing is, is it, it can be quite lucrative, but everything changes every five minutes. So you make a product, you can sell it, and then in three months' time, it's usually obsolete or everything's moved on or you've got to completely redo your videos. So it only took me having to do that so many times until I decided, well, it, I, I need to change the record, really. I, I'm not really enjoying this, and it's a bit of a thankless task. So... That, I think, is what gave me the prod into writing fiction. And the fact that, to be honest with you, I've been writing fiction since I was nine years old. I mean, since yeah. my, de my debut, Mr. Plum and Mr. Apple, which was an early thriller, uh, probably inspired Dan Brown or something like that. I mean, it, it, that went to Penguin Books, would you believe? I've still got my first rejection letter from Penguin Books for that. But I, I'd always written fiction up to about... I'm just trying to think I was writing fiction still, only in short form, in magazine form and children's books and things, uh, until about 21. And then when I started work, I think it just disappeared for 20 years, like it tends to do. And then I came back to it later on in life. So what, what is the biggest difference that you've noticed then for, between publishing or well, self-publishing fiction as opposed to non-fiction? Well, fiction uh, ha has its own difficulties I, I think the one thing i would say the biggest difference i think is that non-fiction is a lot easier to sell and the reason for that is is that it's just a matter of keywords so for instance i've written a book on facebook if somebody wants to know about facebook they're going to go to amazon or to google and they're going to somewhere put the word facebook in there unless they haven't got a clue how to use a search engine somewhere the word facebook is going to be in there so if I've got my description for that non-fiction book produced correctly, if I've used the word Facebook a reasonable number of times, and then other related words, which would probably be something like social media or business pages or whatever it is, then the chances are 
that that book's going to be found and hopefully sold if I've got a decent cover on it and done all the basic marketing things. So I found that nonfiction is, is a lot easier to shift across the piece, really, whereas fiction is it's a different beast altogether. You, the problem with fiction is that at the moment I am an unknown author at the bottom of a very big genre. So until I get known, in which case my keyword or the names of my trilogies will, uh, sorry, the name, my surname, I beg your pardon, my, my, my Christian name surname, Paul T, my author name, that's what I'm trying to say, and the names of my trilogies, the Secret Bunker Trilogy and the Grid Trilogy, until I get some traction, people actually know about those, no one's going to search for those, but they are affect the keywords that are going to get me found. So it's an uphill struggle with fiction, whereas I think with non-fiction, you've got this immediate impetus of having it keyworded. Now, of course, the, the more obscure you get with your non-fiction, the more difficult it is. But if you're doing high-ranking keywords, so my my non-fiction books at the moment are WordPress, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, email marketing. Those are pretty big keywords with a big audience. So I found those a lot easier than the fiction. Okay. Did you pay for any advertising or was it just basically setting up your pages correctly with the right sort of SEO keywords and things for the non-fiction side of things, obviously? I do a bit of both. The, the non-fiction, interestingly, I think, I think I'm right in saying this. Certainly four of them have got to number one in, in the free promo charts, and I think the other two got to two or three. They, they were quite high. And I did that just with, well, a combination of things, actually. I did it with just the impetus of a free promo through KDP Select. So you get five free days in KDP Select, and a combination of that and just being keyworded made them rise to the top of their, I think they were in web marketing, something like that, to the top of their, their ranks in their various categories. So that was great. But the other thing is, because I was in internet marketing, this is the other frustrating thing about moving into fiction, by the way. When I was in internet marketing, I built a list up of it was something like 20, at its peak, it was something like 25,000 subscribers. So I've boiled that right down. There is much, much less than that now. But I, I, about 5,000. So I, I got rid of all the you know, unengaged subscribers and all these things. They all fall by the wayside over a period of time. So I got a core list of about four and a half, five thousand 5,000 subscribers now who are interested in, in geeky stuff, in social media and internet marketing. So being able to market to that email list with the nonfiction and the impetus of having a free promo in KDP Select got those books to number one. Now, when it comes to sales, it's a different thing. They, they, they do sell all the time, but it's much harder, as, as you'll know, to sell things than it is to, to give them away for free. But the advantage of getting one of those books up to number one is that in the back of each book are cross promos to all the other books. Mm. So by, by getting the impetus on a, on a free promo, I then always see the knock on with sales afterwards as people work through the books and buy some of the others. So again, the other point I would make about this is it's always good to write in series. It's always, I, my fiction is in series, and my non-fiction is in series, so that you can give one away for free and hopefully sell some of the rest. Okay. So what advice would you give, if we're staying on the non-fiction side of things for a second, what advice would you give to people to be successful in publishing non-fiction books then? I think you've got to think about keywords, and I think you've got to look for strong, strong areas. So you're always going to be able to get to number one in Amazon on a completely obscure section or area. So I think generally you're looking for the, 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 bigger, the bigger market. So Facebook is a, is a great example. There are lots of Facebook books out there and WordPress books. So th there's, there's no point being number one in a tiny pool where 10 sales get you to the top of that chart because you're still not going to be making very much money with your book. So I, I think you've got to go for something that's reasonably popular, re reasonably broad, but not too broad. This is the old keyword. Thing. Yeah. If it's too broad, uh, you're, you're, not, you're just going to be a small fish in a big pool. So you've got to get the pool size right, I think. Uh, you need to be able to know with nonfiction that you're going to be able to shift a decent number of books. And when you're starting, to be honest with you, unless you get a soar away success a lot of that you're going to get a lot of that initial traction with the freebies with the the kdp select free five-day promos that's going to give you the impetus you need to to come out of the shadows as a complete unknown and to get your book nice and high 
the next trick then is is to have those other books in the series that you can then cross promote i think to get to get the traction but i do think it's i do think it's possible to be an unknown author in non-fiction and to do well very quickly but i think it's a treadmill because your book unless it's it's health i guess or something generic I, I, I mean that that's the big advice i would give is and this is what i'm looking for at the moment unfortunately my area of expertise is in geeky stuff and geeky stuff <laughs> dates too quickly i need a yeah. new area of expertise so I, I i would love to write another non-fiction book I'm, lo- I'm looking at the moment actually i was planning earlier today before we spoke thinking i want to do another non-fiction book but i, I don't want to be on this treadmill all the time it has to be a book that i can publish just like fiction and and leave it there and it's evergreen so on my list of things to do my objectives is evergreen non-fiction books got to be evergreen that's the trick yeah i mean uh, you think of books like uh, napoleon hill's think and grow rich which was written in like the 1930s and is the basically as a sort of a self-help a little bit sort of dated when i've read it but people still hold it up as a kind of an example of mentality and all that stuff so yeah, there are a few sort of evergreen non-fiction books, but they're very few and far between in my my experience. Yeah, they have to be about core principles, yeah. uh, think, things that don't date over time. So I need to come up with my, that was an excellent example of Napoleon Hill, I need to come up with my own Think and Grow Rich. <laughs> yes. Some of the listeners may, may already listen to your show, but you've got your own self-publishing podcast you've you've started a few months ago even though you've done quite a lot of episodes already uh self-publishing journeys so you've interviewed a lot of people for that show what what's the biggest thing that you've learned so far about self-publishing from your guests it's been really interesting actually because i specifically target people who are at the beginning of their self-publishing career so these aren't people who've been at it for years who are making zillions of pounds these are specifically people who are in the struggle stage still, largely, they've got at least one book self-published and they're making sales. That's the criteria I use for the show at the moment. And, and so they've, they've, got, they've overcome a lot of struggles quite recently. And often they're, they're bootstrapping the business. It's coming out of a pension or redundancy money or they're working and, and bootstrapping their self-publishing business. So, so the money is an issue, is the other thing to point out there. So the things that I've learned from talking to people so far is, number one, that it, that it, it is hard work. That, that's the thing. It, I think we all know that. It is hard work, and self-publishing isn't for the faint-hearted. If you're going to give up at the first hurdle, then you're, you're probably not going to make it, not unless you've got a lot of money and you can outsource a lot. I think that the, the biggest hurdle that people experience and I, I always say this to people because I, I teach a lot about websites and things like that. And I always say when I'm teaching businesses, the first disappointment of being online is everybody thinks they're going to build a website and they're going to be a millionaire by the end of the week. And then they learn that actually the website's just the beginning, that, that it's all about the marketing and the SEO and the being found and sending traffic to a website. That's actually what counts. And it's the same with the book. People think that the book is the end of the journey. In actual fact, it's just the beginning of the journey because all you've got is a book. You, can't, you haven't sold it yet. You've got to find customers and you've got to get it out there. So I, I think the marketing is the biggest hurdle. But the thing I've been most impressed with, I think, and, and this really, really interests me, because when, you, when you're listening to self-publishers who are further on in their career, they're often spending just lots and lots of money on adverts. And it's fine if you could afford to do that. But I love the resourcefulness of the authors that I talk to on my podcast, there's a lady called Nina Ratcliffe who, who writes uh, horse books and she sells most of her books going around Gymkhana's in the summer <laughs> and people just love them. And that in turn, though, has led to her going into schools and doing talks and it just self-perpetuates. And I just think that's wonderful. You wouldn't hear that from a superstar self-publisher. But what a great strategy for somebody who's based in a local community to use it was i thought it was genius and she's got some pull-ups and things and she goes to the gymkhanas and just sells loads of books because she's going where her audience go and 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 it's just a basic marketing principle isn't it go where your audience hang out and that's exactly what she's doing so i i just think what i've been really impressed with is the resilience and the resourcefulness of the self-publishers and why the reason i do my podcast is i I want to be talking to people who I think are going to be the big self-publishers in, in two and three years' time when they've pushed through those barriers and got a few more books out. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting to hear 
like a different selection of people. I mean, not meaning to criticise some other podcasts, but there there have been times when there have been the same guests who appear on every single show, who have been interviewed, and they go round in a big circle. And uh, while that can be interesting the first time you hear the first interview, it's actually quite nice to hear a, like a different set of people being interviewed occasionally. <laughs> Yeah, I think my, my view of it is you've absolutely got to set a line in the distance and you've got to look at what people who are way ahead of you are doing and you've got to, con- you've got to listen to what they're doing and pick up the tips and, and you've got to put them in your kit bag maybe for later as your business scales up. So I think you've always got to have your eye on what the guys who are way ahead of you are doing. But similarly, those of us who are still beginning to sell books on a small scale, we don't have those budgets. We can't just keep throwing dollars and dollars at Facebook marketing, for instance. We have to do it in a smaller way. So we've got to build to that. So I think it's also useful. My my default listener to my podcast is someone who's either just published the first book and had that initial disappointment of, you know, the world didn't come banging on the door to buy it, (laughs) which I think we all have at some point. It's the first hurdle we have to get over. You know, or they're somebody who knows that they want to self-publish but haven't really got a clue where to start. And so we're really going through... The basic stuff, the, the first uploads and the how do you get the covers done and things like that. Because I, think, I still think very strongly that there's a need to be producing that kind of information because we're constantly getting new people into self-publishing. And as I say, the people hopefully I'm talking to are going to be the, the big guys and gals in, in two to three years' time. That would be lovely, wouldn't it, to, <laughs> to, to see some of those people um, at the top of their profession then. Well, as I've been interviewed on your show, I hope that everybody who's interviewed on your show is massively successful in two years' time. We've got the golden touch, Tim. That's yeah. Enough. What would you say is the biggest mistake you've made so far in your own self-publishing journey? Well, I'll admit an embarrassing one to you. Um, my Secret Bunker trilogy is, is based on a visit with the family to a real secret bunker in Scotland. It's an amazing place. It's where the Scottish government would have gone if we'd had a nuclear war. It's a massive place size of a couple of football pitches underground and it's based in there and I was going to do a signing and a some photographs and videos and things there last Easter and I wanted to bring a pull-up because oh, I was going on telly too the, the telly were there and they wanted to do a, an item so I got a t-shirt printed so that they, they couldn't avoid getting the books on the telly and on the, on the photos uh, with the book covers on and I got a pull-up and I didn't take any notice really of the pull-up I'm very careless with the small print and I, I thought this pull-up would be portable. And when it arrived, it was absolutely massive. My, mm. Two of my kids like, had to carry it in. Uh, uh, it was huge. Um, and I had assumed wrongly that this thing would fold and be portable in the car. But it, it, it was massive and it weighed a ton. Uh, and it was completely over the top. I, I managed to, I wasn't even sure I could get it in the car to get it up to Scotland for this photography session. It did. Fortunately, our car's quite a long one. So all the seats went back and the, the, you know, all the bits in the boot went out. And I managed to jam it in at an angle and, and get it up to Scotland. And I just had to abandon it up there. My, my idea was that I would take it for talks whenever I did talks. <laughs> um, but it was absolutely out of the question. It was far too big and it cost way more than it should. Let's put it this way. It cost a good cover. That, uh, that banner so that's my own silly fault I should have looked at the small print yeah the only way you ever learn is by making mistakes though so uh, I was careless I, should, I just should have <laughs> taken more attention ne- never mind but um, that, what that brings me back to though is, is what I was, was going to say about self-publishing is that actually nothing that you do that's a mess can't be fixed in self-publishing um, you know there's a few things that can't be fixed like if you put something horrendously libelous out and you're sued or something like that yeah. so there's a few things like that that, ca- that can't be fixed but most things can be fixed. So if you publish a book that has errors in it and you spot them later, that's fine. Just republish it and, and get a better version out there. No, no one dies. It's not perfect, but no one dies. When I, when I do talks to, about self-publishing, I always say to people that we're all striving for, for perfection. We, we want perfection. But somewhere between perfection and imperfection, there's a point at which it's acceptable. What I call good to go or it's good to launch. And you need to strive. You need to get a, a strive for perfection all the time. But there is a point at which it's good to launch. You need to get it out there then, because to me, anything else is procrastination. Get it out there, and you'll soon find out if there are mistakes in it. Obviously, at that stage, you've taken every step you can to make sure there aren't mistakes in it. But if there are then mistakes in it, just go back and republish it and sort it out later. Uh, you can fix virtually everything. I think the other mistake is I, I did my 
recorded all the videos for my online course, which is uh, Self Publishing Academy. And I worked through all the videos, and that's everything I've learned self publishing. Well, I say it's 13 books, it's way more than 13 books, but th 13 books recently. And at the end of it, all I could think was, I'm doing too much of this work. I, I need to be doing less of this work and outsourcing more of it because I know, I know an awful lot about the process now and I do it all. And what I realized was is this isn't creative. I need to be putting words on paper and getting books out. I, I need to try and do less of this. Now, part of that is a money management thing. Uh, when you start self-publishing, I, I, I absolutely pay for the covers. I paid for the covers from day one because that's so important. I pay for a proof and copy editor. I want to start paying for uh, developmental editors now. But this is, you're up for one and a half to two thousand pounds before you even draw breath when you do this. Um, so you have to make editorial judgments about what's good to be a priority and what's not good to be uh, a priority. So my books do get read. And, and read through and through and through, and they go through a proofreader and all of this thing. But it's always about trying to get them as good as you can. So I, I think I'm doing too much of the work myself. My aspiration is to outsource more and more of it. But that is a that's an income outgoings kind of question. A, a, you know, profit loss. <laughs> you know, to put it in business terms, it's a cash flow thing. Yeah, well, I mean, there's always this, this, there's a trade off between money and time. Um, it's one of the sad facts of life or, or well the other trade-off is of course is quality i mean you can spend nothing on something and spend no time on it and it'll be rubbish or you can you can spend a lot of time on it and not much money and it'll be a reasonable quality so there's all sorts of possibilities and i think you're right as in i think for a beginner self-publishing and you learn stuff through the process of self-publishing your first few books anyway i think there is a lot to be said for starting with a lower cost shorter fiction or non-fiction and there would would you say if you were if you were doing your career again would you start with non-fiction again or would you start with fiction i think i, I think i don't i think i'd still go with non-fiction the, the thing about non-fiction is i find it pretty boring to write because i do know these topics the topics i've written i know really well so with the non-fiction, it's been a case of just getting what's in my head out onto the page as, as soon as possible. And it's almost been a frustration because it's just, I've got all this stuff in my head. I need to get it out here in some coherent manner. Uh, and so w with the non-fiction, uh, it's easier, I guess. With the fiction, you've got to do a lot more planning. There are a lot more stresses and strains as you manoeuvre the plot and the characters and things like that. But I love, I love the non I love the fiction. I love the process. I was writing one of my writing days last week, Thursday, Friday. I just love it. I love the creative process and creating characters and, and the storylines. And I find it much more satisfying doing the, the fiction. But the non fiction is easier to just sit down and get a book out. Uh, that's, that's the truth of it, unfortunately. So I suspect strategically I'll do a little bit of both. But I want to do more fiction than non-fiction. Yeah, so you want to be progressing away from your non-fiction books into just being pure fiction, if you can, if they if they take off after people hear hear about your books on this show and they rush out <laughs> and buy them in droves. Well, I'm looking for a tipping point, Tim. What I, yeah. what I did is I, I strategically got the non-fictions out because I knew that I could achieve a level of success with that, and that allowed me then to talk, to create a podcast, to have some level of proven expertise and ability in that area you know albeit not in the best sellers list yet or anything like that so I, I did that strategically but but what i want to do is achieve a tipping point so my, my aim by the end of this year is to have my two trilogies my two sci-fi trilogies out and to have three fiction uh, full-length thrillers out uh, that's by the end of december they might not be out by the end of december but they'll be written by the end of december and going through all the proofing and, and, and editing processes so that's my aim, and at that point, that's nine fictions. That's that's pretty good. That's pretty good, and that writing in two genres. And at that point, I'll start to whittle down the non-fiction. I'll start to let them drop off the edge. And I, what I'd like to have, I think, is is just that definitive evergreen non-fiction. I'd like to find the thing that isn't going to date, and and write a really good non-fiction. And I'm not sure what that's going to be yet. Probably it might be about time management or or mindset or it'll be something like yeah. that i think something that's not going to date i'm not quite sure what it is yet but we'll get there we'll get there in terms of the, the genres that you've written your fiction books in did you pick them because you like writing them or was there 
some idea as to what sells in the Kindle store in terms of like fiction books, or is it purely you're doing it as a creative? This is the genres you like to write. Yeah, I meant to mention this when you said about mistakes that you've made in your self-publishing journey, because I think with The Secret Bunker, I wrote the story that I wanted to write. The, the, the tale of that is that I um, had, I'd got a quiet bit, I'm self-employed, and I had a, a, what they called a, a resting moment. You know, I was an actor who was resting, yeah. uh, in that I, I didn't really have a lot of work on, and I needed to busy myself. And there was a writing competition that I'd recommended actually to my eldest child, my wife and my sister, all of whom say they want to be writers. And they completely ignored it. And I woke up one morning with an idea and thought, I'm going to go in for this competition. And so I wrote the first 5,000 words, found it much easier than I thought. And then when I, it's about the small print again. Remember I said about the small print, I hadn't read the small print. So I sent this thing off thinking, there you go, that's 5,000 words, that was easy. And was reading the small print for the competition, then found out that if I got anywhere with this competition, I was supposed to have the old book written by September, <laughs> I think it was. So I thought, all right, I'd better go on with it then. So I, I finished writing the book, and then it turned into a trilogy, which I thoroughly enjoyed writing. Um, but I hadn't really thought about audience at all. When I wrote it, I thought, oh, this is probably, it's the sort of stuff I like to watch. So it's Hunger Games, it's Maze Runner, it's Diversion. I, I love that kind of stuff. I love watching it at the cinema. I love reading it. So it, it's that, really. That's where it's aimed. But notionally, I thought it was a young adult audience. I'll be frank with you. I haven't got a clue how to target a young adult audience. So actually, all my readers are adults. I just sell it as an adult book uh, in sci-fi dystopian, and it, and it seems to exist very happily there. Uh, the same with The Grid, The Grid Trilogy. The Grid Trilogy is probably older. I did make it um, older in terms of the protagonist, so it's much more in divergent Hunger Games territory, and it's much more beefed up in terms of the action and the, the violence level. So it's not, it's not unpleasant violence, but it's just a little bit rougher than the other one. But it's still sci-fi dystopian. Now, with the thriller that I'm writing at the moment, that, that's going in psychological thrillers. Yeah. I absolutely know where that's going, and that's a lovely big audience so it's is it paula hawkins it's the, it's that it's that it's going in the same category there that's where it's going not police procedural or anything like that so i'd be much more mindful this time to put it about the audience and it's definitely an adult audience for this yeah. one whereas i i it's a young adult thing i haven't got a clue how to target them I, i'm just very lucky i guess that lots of adults don't seem to have a problem with it at all it's been read exclusively by adults none of them have said it's a kid's book because, yeah. because it's not really. It's not a kid's book. It's a, it's a young adult's book. It's, it's an adult book. It just doesn't have, I guess it doesn't have a lot of violence in and it doesn't have any sex in. And that's, I guess that's what makes it suitable for young adults. But that's, that's the only thing that makes it suitable for young adults. What, they are, what all those books are, I hope, is great thrillers. They're thrillers, really. Adventure thrillers. So where can people find out about you and uh, your podcast and all your books um, i'm all over the place on the web so the easiest link i think to give is the podcast which is selfpublishingjourneys.com uh, that is hyphenated but i also realized realizing my error with that i also bought the one that isn't hyphenated so however you put it in you'll get there so self selfpublishingjourneys.com and then i do all my geeky stuff which tends to be more the non-fiction stuff you'll find that at paulteague.com so they're separated off the author stuff and the geeky stuff is generally separated off and from there you'll be able to find all the various social media channels amazon book author links and all of that sort of stuff okay well it's very nice to talk to you today paul it's been great coming on tim thank you Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please stop by iTunes and rate and leave a review. This helps make the show more visible. For free resources, show notes, and other helpful content, join the community at beginselfpublishing.com. 